Welcome in. Just gonna give it a minute or two. If you're not muted, if you could go ahead and mute your mic. Great. All right, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chelsea and I'm very excited you're here to join us this week. If this is your first time, welcome. And if you were here last week, thank you for dealing with the technical difficulties. Fingers crossed that my Wi-Fi is working and smooth, but if not, Erin's a pro, so she'll just take it over and I'll hop back in as soon as I can. Um, but just a quick intro on me. My name is Chelsea. I'm a freelance stage manager in New York. I met Erin through SMMP and then we worked together at New Harmony Theater. And today she's gonna kind of talk to us about working in opera and dance and all of the things, because Erin stage manages all of the things all the time. And then she's gonna go into a little discussion on unemployment, and then we're gonna hop into a little Q&A. So Erin, if you wanna give us a little intro and get started. Sure, I turned you off a of spotlight so they could see you instead of just my face staring at you for a while. Uh, hi, a lot of you may have known my face from the Stage Managers Association webinars. I'm the forums and webinars chair for that, which we've really ramped up over the last six or seven weeks since March. Uh, I'm also, yes, we met during USITT, Drinking Glass Branding, uh, uh, Stage Management Mentorship Project. Uh, it was, uh, so she was one of the mentees, I was one of the mentors. Um, I, for USITT, I'm a vice commissioner in management for, long title, portfolio reviews and interview materials prep and special projects. Um, and when they, they added the special projects on, I said, what does that mean? Um, so this year, what it meant was I was tasked with putting together a paperwork exhibit. And I didn't, that, yes, I love paperwork. I could geek out over paperwork for days. Um, but that didn't sound quite as interesting to me. So I worked with my friend Jennifer Lee Se Searshire. Um, and we did one, uh, we turned into a webinar for now on uh, stage management paperwork through the centuries. So we had paperwork back to the 15 and 1600s um, up to the present day. I was really geeking out over early computer icons like Mac Wright fonts that were really bad and that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm very involved nationally volunteering for both of those organizations, Stage Managers Association and the United States Institute for Theater Technology. Um, I'm also a freelance stage manager. So I am live to you from my guest room in um, Denver, Aurora, Colorado area. Uh, I hardly ever end up working in my own state. Uh, five, four and a half years ago, I left um, a steady uh, job that had health benefits and all sorts of stuff, um, but it wasn't as artistically fulfilling as I was hoping it would be to jump back into the scary world of freelancing. And I have a list here. I'm going to pull it up because I can't remember. Uh, since October 2015, going back to freelancing, I've done 12 operas, nine musicals, seven plays, two years of the Nevada Ballet Theater's large Vegas style Nutcracker, two staged St. Matthew's Passion, which is what you see behind me. It's all orchestra on stage. Uh, there tend to be over 200 performers uh, involved in that between all of the double orchestra, two different choirs, um, and, and principal singers. And it's usually not staged, but we did it semi-staged. Uh, two events and also a Cirque Dreams production. Uh, musicals are my favorite, though. So, um, yeah, and I've, I've toured with the Rocks, Rackettes for five years. I grew up doing the Lort Theater thing, um, and musicals are still my favorite, but I like really working on all of them. What else do you want to know, Chelsea? Great. So I guess one of my biggest questions is since um, you've worked in a lot of different genres, uh, what is probably, um, are there, what are the similarities and what are the differences, like the biggest? Oh, that's a short, simple, easy to answer question. Yeah. Uh, so it's really about the performers, whether do you call them actors or singers or dancers, and invariably I'll call them the wrong thing first as I jump to the next genre, um, how quick the process is. And then there's just terminology that changes back and forth. And also how self-sufficient are the performers or not, and how much am I involved with it? So musical theater is one of the longest processes I get to have. And somewhat, it's, it's, it's usually happy, bouncy music a lot of the time and very fun for me. Um, Chelsea and I did one musical together. Um, but uh, opera is sort of the, the, the biggest difference in, uh, well, they're all different. <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> Um, the biggest thing about opera is that the music is the absolute focus. 
and they ask, can you read music? And um, I've, I've done a whole hour long webinar on this. They just had a Q and A with the year of the stage manager about opera. So trying to condense it into three minutes is not gonna happen. Um, I do have a blog series, Opera Stage Management 101. So if you self promote, go to my website, erinjoyswank.com and look for the opera tag. There's um, a seven part series right now that a lot of people found very helpful. Um, but the music is king. And, and they say, yes, you have to read music. You need to quantify it. Can you play a musical instrument? Um, because everything is based on the voice. It's an older form. A lot of times there are new music, new operas, and those tend to be some of my favorites. But generally speaking, the opera is done without microphones. So they're amplifying over a very large orchestra, um, uh, which makes for, depending on the acoustics of the place, a somewhat stereotypically more stilted um, performance, but it's because they literally can't look this way or their voice isn't heard so much. So there's a lot of, I love you, and you're like, she's over there. <laughs> um, but, uh, but as a result, everything is based along how long can the singers sustain their throat and their vocal production over the course of performing. So uh, they aren't expected to sing all day. You just can't, that would wear them out. They aren't expected to sing every day. So uh, in a lot of ways, it's a crunched thing, but then uh, you're actually not hearing them sing every day necessarily. They're marking, they're, they're taking things down an octave if it's really high or up an octave if it's really low. Um, or they're just mouthing the words, which is even more so why stage managers need to have to know how to read music because you can't just rely on the words that are coming out of their mouth. Um, uh, you're, you're following along and you're, you're using anything you can to help. Uh, um, there are orchestra numbers and rehearsal numbers that you're highlighting. So you can say, we're going to take it from number 10, which is in the middle of the second aria, that kind of thing. Um, so it's not just the 10th. Musicals have like number 10 is the name of that song. And that's helpful for musicals to get, make sure the orchestra is on the correct piece of music because we're all looking at different page numbers. But then there are rehearsal numbers within operas. And so you're basing it off of that if we're all following the same reduced piano vocal score for the stage management staff and the artistic director, or, or the, the stage director um, and the performers, you can say which page, which system, which is which line of music it is, and even which measure. Uh, all the paperwork is done by a placement, which is those, those three numbers in a row. Um, but you're also, uh, kind of one of the most fun things is you may tech a show, and then usually the night before opening is like the craziest one of musical theater and play, and you're trying to get everything perfect, and often that's a day off in the opera world. <laughs> so either you can rest and relax and go have a drink or whatever you want, or you can use it to catch up on your paperwork or to review that part of the music that you may have be a little trickier to follow, take the recording kind of stuff. Um, but then during a typical rehearsal day, um, depending on how big your show is, uh, there's often like, say you'll have a, a 10 to one rehearsal, um, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., a two to five and a seven to 10, but any given performer may only be there for two of those three. Stage management's there the whole time, but uh, the principals may take two of those. The chorus may only come in the evenings. Uh, the supernumeraries, which are the, your filler out of the crowd, your, your spear handlers, um, your servants, that kind of stuff, they probably are gonna come the same time as the chorus, but not necessarily. The chorus was only given the music for their scenes. Uh, the supers probably weren't even given the music at all. And my favorite scene, uh, uh, way to explain what stage management does to we, we help fill in the puzzle pieces. So there's your stereotypical, hang on, drinking scene. <laughs> it is Tipsy Tuesday. Um, so you will have a, a super carry on a tray of glasses. And then a chorus member will come over and take two of those glasses, keep one for themselves and hang one off to the principal who's then going to give a toast. So at any rehearsal, any of those three people might be missing. So often the assistant stage managers have to know enough of the blocking so they can fill in for those people. Um, and if both the chorus and the super aren't there, you probably don't have to stand in for the super um, unless ultimately somebody's giving a glass back to them. Um, but you probably need to hand off the toast and then maybe the principal's not there for the evening rehearsal. So you're, thank you, and acting like you're, you know, badly acting because none of us were paid to do that part of it. Um, but you may not get everybody in the rehearsal hall until that very last rehearsal before you go into tech. 
So we are helping everybody go along. It's why, if you've heard the stereotype of why they call places so much, why they cue people on stage, all of that is based on because they haven't been there. <laughs> uh, the principals are less likely to need to be cued um, because, or even want to be cued. And so even if they're late, we still get blamed for it if they didn't take off in time, but you can do all your best and just be like, I didn't go when I said it. Um, but think about any rehearsal you've done and you move it to the stage and now all that black masking legs are in the way. And it changes every entrance. Well, in opera, we have so little time. We have about three or four hours a night of maybe four times from hitting the stage. So there's no time, and, and they're pretty much run-throughs. They're not sit and wait for the lights. Uh, so uh, we have all the placements as an ASM, uh, which I do like to ASM too. Um, and there was a whole webinar about that. <laughs> so look for that one for USITT. Um, but uh, so, you know, something happens and it's late, they'll just tell the ASMs, hey, move their entrance back two measures. Great, you move your post-it, you cue them at a different time, nobody has to know what that sounds like, it just works out if everybody keeps walking at the same pace. Um, the same with, uh, so the, the chorus members know that they entered stage right for this scene and they exit stage left and they have to be back to stage right for the next one, but they don't get the concept that there's 25 minutes between those scenes, but also they have to go downstairs, change clothes, maybe get a new wig, all of that stuff, people talking to them in English, people upstairs rehearsing, saving their voice, singing differently, not singing at all. Nobody knows where we are. And the Shan opera is usually repetitive. Uh, so nobody knows where they are. So we give them a, a place that's called not just at the top of each act, but five minutes out before their entrance. And then we, generally speaking, the ASMs also then have a two minute marker in their books. They are following along their books the whole time backstage um, or iPads these days or various things. Uh, I'm still a paper gal. Um, and so if they don't see somebody by two minutes, they ask for a repage because like, we need them. They're not here. Whereas sometimes actors are like in musical theater or, act or plays are like, I'm coming. People in operas do tend to freak out if they're not there by two minutes. Um, so, and you'll page the wardrobe to help them and all sorts of stuff. Uh, it could be also very plug and play. So if somebody's done Carmen before and they know that they're Carmen again, um, that, that, but it's like, sometimes they may need a stage right or stage left because we had so little rehearsal, like which city am I in? <laughs> am I coming in stage right? Oh yes, I'm coming in stage right. But sometimes you add that to the call just to help them out, depending on how short your process is. So, um, and then there's like uh, cultural differences in everything. So find out if it's your first time in a genre, what are certain people called? So in musical theater, the conductor, the musical director is often forgotten about even when you're giving notes, the director has all the notes and you're like, oh yeah, did you have anything? And they might throw in a couple musical notes. Opera, the maestro is not, you don't call them by their first name unless you're told you can. Now that said, a lot of maestros are like, just call me a gem or whatever their name is. But when in doubt, you call them maestro. Female too, maestro is, is often more preferred than maestra. Um, and you just assume that you're calling maestro until you're told otherwise to use a different name. Um, I do the same when I'm in any kind of a, a um, classical orchestra pit, whether it's for a ballet, whether it's for a symphony, I will say maestro until I'm told otherwise, because um, it is generally more respected too than the poor musical director who often doesn't gets forgotten about and they're like oh yeah did you need to hear the show because they're rehearsing on stage without mics you wanted to hear yeah a lot of times happens in musicals um so that's kind of the the bigger nutshell of opera is oh, and then as a result um all of the paperwork is awesome because stage management are the only ones who really know the show. There's no time for a wardrobe mistress to, I, I say mistress, it's stereotypical, but a lot of times it is a wardrobe mistress in my, um, uh, in my world. Um, they don't have time to sit and look over the paperwork as much. It's a lot of plug and play. So you've got very detailed, whether it's photos or very intricately word document with where everything goes and it's in a different color because, hey, this is the thing that moved. Um, and then they've got down to the timings that you've taken as well as the placement sometimes of exactly when that handoff is. And when in doubt, you have every prop handed to a performer and retrieved um, rather than trusting them to go to the, the trust is the wrong word, but it's just, there's so little time. So if you can have everybody on everything that happens, um, it just makes for a better tech. Um, yeah, so opera is the biggest sort of like 
mondo, lots of stuff going on and takes the most explanation. Um, dance, it depends what kind of dance. And it, for those who are interested, we just started up a new Facebook group, Dance Stage Management. So I encourage you to look for it. It's been posted on as many of the stage management things as we can find. Um, to come join us. Uh, I will say when you join, there are two questions you need to answer. They're really hard questions. One is, are you a real person? And the <laughs> other one is, will you ab abide by our rules, which are basically be kind <laughs> and respect people's privacy. But if you haven't collected those, then we have to track you down more and stuff like that. So if you're still waiting, it's because it actually, you have not answered that you will follow the rules. Um, but join us for there for dis discussion, all things dance. Um, there's, there's ballet people, there's modern dance people, all sorts of stuff. My dance experience is I spent five years with the Rockettes, which uh, are a different kind of dance troupe than anybody else. They're so specific with precision. And Chelsea can probably attest that I am sort of a Nazi when it comes to taping out a set because I had used to have to be down to a quarter of inch of accuracy for my spikes, including how the, sp the spikes were. Um, was it? No, it wasn't your year. We learned how to tape a circle. Um, uh, that was the year before. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, dancers, the nice thing about working with dancers is they're usually so self-sufficient. They don't expect, they're, they're used to not having props people in the room or, or stage managers to follow things, especially on a, like a ballet company where I may not be brought in. Uh, when the two years I did Vegas, I wasn't brought in until the week before tech. So they've been rehearsing for months um, and know what props they need and all sort of stuff to the point where you're like, I can set, oh, you set that? It's like, yeah, I can set that. And so can the assistant stage manager. Yeah, so we, we got you and looking out for them, but they're so used to looking out for themselves. And if anything happens that they get hurt, they know so much better than I do about, you know, do they need ice? Do they need to walk it off? Do they, you know, yes, they might be a bit martyrdom because that's a lot of what dancers' lives are. But generally the other people in the room are much, even though I had, at one point I had my wilderness first responder and I'm definitely first aid and CPR certified. I usually see if somebody else wants to try to tackle it first because they usually know much better than me. Um, otherwise, like Rockettes was set up more on a sort of, um, a Broadway style. So I was the second in line in stage management and, as, and we called them backstage. And as soon as we opened, I trained in to call the show. So we had enough people rotating to do that kind of a thing. Um, dance captains take care of all of the notes. There aren't really, you're not doing line notes because only Santa, well, you might for Santa and the elves. <laughs> If they really can't get their lines, but otherwise you're not doing line notes. Um, you're not doing for opera. It's all on the music staff. Um, uh, you're not doing it for Cirque Dreams because there is no wording in Cirque yeah. Dreams. If anything, there's yoo-hoos and then even they get, they got notes about saying a word that sounded like a word. So that actually kind of was a line note if he said you hoo too much. Um, but uh, yeah, but, but calling a dance, there's, there's more boom lights in the way off stage. Yeah. Um, uh, so trying to get crew members to be there with flashlights or to go upstage, upstage, upstage as they're coming off stage. Or um, one of the more interesting things for me when I was calling for the um, Nutcracker, we were double and triple cast. And I learned during tech with one cast and then all of a sudden I realized Unlike the Rockettes, that's the one thing working with the rock, Rockettes so much, it's hard for me to watch a dance where everybody isn't exactly the same. You know, this is not the same as this in my world <laughs> from, from spending five years with the Rockettes. And so especially then when I'm calling off of a principal dancer off of their movements and then they're supposed to be doing the same and they're not doing the same. I had to totally change some of my cues. So this big, uh, the transition from uh, battle into snow, the nutcracker dies, spoiler alert. Um, and then as he came up, he'd look at, at Clara and then he'd go like this and the curtain would rise. And so I got, so I knew that the guy I had done all of my tech with, he was like, da, 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 da. He did it right on the downbeat. No problem. I knew when to call it. And then that year was triple cast. And both of the other two, they got up so fast that I had to call it as soon as I started standing. Otherwise my curtain was going to be late. Um, so learning with that kind of stuff. And also that show went back and forth between tracked music and orchestra. And the tempos weren't necessarily the same. Uh, but I had videos that had to match. And so trying to figure all of that out the first year was really interesting. Um, uh, interesting, fun, fun, <laughs> a challenge. Um, yeah. And then Cirque Dreams, trying to just throw in another genre in. 
um, is very, if, if the show is, is built right, which took us a bit, a bit uh, we didn't understand how to build the show because there were a bunch of us new, but when it's built right, uh, the idea is that all of the lighting cues are based on the major act that's going on. So Cirque Dreams is, if you and if, if people aren't familiar, it's sort of like the smaller version. Uh, he would hate that I said that, the guy who does it is in charge of Cirque Dreams, but it's like you have at most two, actually we had three performers in the air at one point, instead of your 12 you might have for a Cirque du Soleil show. Um, it's still under the umbrella of Cirque du Soleil now, they've been bought out. Um, so I did technically work for Cirque du Soleil International or whatever is there. I should know what my boss's top title was, but that wasn't what was on the pay stub. Um, but um, so, and this, the, the director prided himself on, if you came back to the show, you wouldn't see the same thing twice. There was so much going on. So we spent all of the text slash rehearsal time uh, just figuring out how we were gonna transfer it for the first time into an in the round, in the round show when it only ever been proscenium before. So how can we use the aisles, whatever. I hardly ever got to see the actual acts, the aerial acts. I remember at one point there's this major fashion show going on and I literally said to myself, oh yeah, there's supposed to be an aerial act going on during all of this. And ultimately that's where half of my cues were based off of her. I only got to start see her a few times. Mm -hmm. But a lot of stage management for me was making sure the crucial, crucial lights hadn't burned out as we would go to each new look because there was a scene where a guy was doing, it's called Rollabola. So he's up on a big platform and then he's got like a circular metal tube stacked onto another circular metal tube and another one and he's trying to make them all not fall and stand on top of them. The lights were actually brighter on the floor than on his face because he had to be able to look down. And if any of those lights were out, that was a problem. And we had a couple shows where like, tell Victor the downright light is out you know, giving him a heads up so he could adjust. And, and, and he even, you know, came back to me from my wardrobe head saying, can he adjust and face this? I'm like, whatever he needs to do for safety. Yes, he can look down left instead for that moment. I don't care, you know. Um, or we didn't really have understudies. So like uh, the final show, my singer lost her voice. Uh, the other singer could cover for her, but all of a sudden she was supposed to step through this major portion of an aerial act. And so we were on the fly coming up with all sorts of background things. And it also ultimately, the director was in the audience and he didn't even notice a lot of the covering that we had done until this one major move. And he's like, what's up with both girls walking through? And they're like, well, this, this, this. And he's like, oh, well, that was a good fix. <laughs> you know? um, so how do you constantly, and again, they're, they're such consummate acrobats and performers and stuff. They know what they need and they'll tell you, I'm adjusting this part of, and you're like, okay, great if I have to change a lighting cue or whatever. And then we did have contingency plans. Um, so um, that Rollabola, the thing with all the stacking stuff, um, he had two song pieces that he, two tracks that he was to. The whole first one, if he fell during any of that, um, we could cover, doesn't matter, we just kept going. But the second one was all about him stacking seven on top of each other. And uh, if something happened and it did three times during performance, then I had a contingency plan where we would fade down the music, but not too far so it wasn't dead air. We'd wait for his assistant to start basically sort of like, let's keep Tim Tinkerbell alive, clapping. Yeah. Um, they would do that and try to get the audience prepared. Um, well, the, technically the contingency plan was see if Victor wants to do it again. We knew that the answer was going to be yes, Victor wants to do it again. Um, so we'd wait as he start clapping, then I'd restart the music, we'd do it again. If he fell a second time, I was not allowed to try it again. However, Victor, when I did it, knock wood, mm -hmm. never fell the second time. Um, so having those contingency plans, and then I happen to have rotating board operators. So it was very important to be like, you cannot turn the lights out to go into pre-show until I make an announcement. Because behind that wall, somebody is standing on top of somebody else's shoulders having a warm-up. Um, major warm-ups too, um, starting up to three hours in advance of, of, and you had to be mopped and dried before all of that too, because everybody wants to run through all of their stuff. Um, so yeah, those are sort of the, the, Versions. I'm sure there's so much more to go on, but of you know, what's kind of some of the, the highlights of working yeah. in those genres? If uh, you guys want to start uh, typing in questions, and we can get to them because I know it's already 6:24, um, but or 4:24 if you're in Mountain Time Zone. Truth. Um, do you want to dive into? Because I know we've talked about mentioning it. 
um, especially with everything going on. Oh, um, right. Employment, unemployment. All of the chaos. Erin yeah. is the go-to person. I, definitely I am, sadly. I'm sadly the go-to person about unemployment. Um, if you have not filed for unemployment yet and you feel you need to, I do have a blog post written January of last year. So it is not pandemic related whatsoever. Um, but sort of the big things to know, one of the, one of the things that's come up is whether you are uh, an employee or an independent contractor. Because only in the employee system, which is the, the W2, W4 system, the company is paying into your unemployment benefits. And you can only earn unemployment for how much money you've got socked in that little bank account, for lack of a better word. And so if nobody's been putting in for you because you've only taken 1099 or independent contractor gigs, then you aren't usually eligible for unemployment. So as you're taking a gig, every union gig is always a W-2. Um, and so, but every non-union gig goes back and forth. Is it a 1099? Is it a W-2? And as you're accepting a job, take that into account for so many reasons because there are generally better protections. If you, I mean, hello, unions protect us. Um, so they, of course, they're going to have some of the better ones. Um, uh, but even, uh, you know, cert dreams. So I am equity and I am AGMA. I work non-union in some of those other jurisdictions because that's like AGMA only has 67 signatories, 67 companies in the entire country, opera and ballet. Those are the only ones that use an AGMA contract unless somebody uses a guest artist contract, which is very rare. Um, so AGMA has, lets their members work non-union. So opera and ballet, I tend to do a fair amount of non-union. I have worked union as well. Um, and then there's, a, you know, this whole Cirque thing, which could be AGVA. Even when I toured with the Rockettes, the performers were AGVA and the stage managers were not. And that's some of those 67 of AGMA. Uh, also, at least 10 of them don't put their stage managers on a contract, only the performers. So when somebody from equity goes, you can't work non-union, it's like, well, I kind of have to if I'm going to work in the other genres for some of it. Um, I sure, I would love to take the union jobs when I can, um, but that's just not how they're as set up in the other areas. Um, but as you're looking on paper, if you have two jobs that are even, um, I'm going to be terrible with the numbers here, but let's say that you've got the offer for a $500 a week employee gig and a $750 a week uh, independent contractor. Well, first glance, that $750 looks so much better. But then you have to start going, well, they didn't take any of my taxes out. They didn't put anything into my unemployment. Oh, and for me, if I'm looking at an SPT contract or a LORT contract or whatever of equity, oh, those go towards my health insurance. If I can rack up enough weeks for my health insurance, that's going to save me $900 a month next year. So these are all of the things that I'm working on as I tr try to figure out my freelancing gig. So I really do try to plug in my equity stuff first because that's going to be my health insurance and the way the state of our world right now. And that's why also so many of us are freaking out in the equity world because we don't know when we're going to earn any more weeks. So, so many of us are looking at not making our weeks for this year. Even if we were close or whatever, um, we're, we're very worried about that. So, um, uh, how can I make this any shorter about unemployment? But uh, so what you need to gather before you file for unemployment is all of the W-2, this is be pre-pandemic, uh, all of the W-2 gigs, your start date, your end date, the reason you left the job, our fancy wording is lack of work or laid off. Uh, you weren't fired. And your answer of when did you know you were going to be let off is usually the day you accepted the job because you knew when closing date was. Um, there's usually a comment line and you go, I am a freelance worker. I know from the date I am hired where, you know, I add in all this stuff to go, I'm a real person. I don't fit government box as well. Um, you need to know if you, your payroll address was the same as the place where you worked. So if you were, um, uh, paid through a Vegas company, but you actually worked in, in Colorado, they want both of those things. Now, if you worked rehearsal hall and the office in one building and you happen to do a theater in another building, it's still the same one. You don't have to put that second venue down because you did spend time in the office that was on that payroll too. So don't, don't go that crazy with it. You're going to need a supervisor's name, their contact information, um, all this kind of stuff. Again, it's all in my blog post. Um, and then you're, they're going to look back 
it, it's a good idea right now for many reasons to go ahead and start listing everything you've ever done in your life in theater. When you get to be my age, you're going to forget so many of them, even though you swear you're not going to. You're like, oh yeah, I did that staged reading for two weeks. Totally forgot about that one. Um, Make yourself a list, but especially right now, get the start and stop dates and all that kind of contact information for the last a good year and a half. Um, right now, when I, so I refile for unemployment every February. And so I have to look um, at the previous, a year's worth, but not in the preceding quarter. So for me, I have to look from October of one year to the end of September the next year. So when I filed in February this year, they didn't count my October, November, December wages um, for 2019. The people that are filing right now, because we've hit a new quarter of April and May, they now have the easiest time of the year to file if there is such a thing, because all you have to do is get your tax documents. Those W-2s and those 1099s got printed off, that is in your entire four quarters. So when I had to put my husband on it, because he's an IATC stagehand, it was, uh, he actually filed before all of his friends, so we had to try to figure out from his paychecks of who he worked for which weeks and stuff like that. Now his friends and my friends that were helping out, it's like, just grab your 1099s and your W-2s. And so now the, the short version of the pandemic structure is they're still looking at all that information and figuring out what your base rate is. And then they're adding $600 to it for March 25th, I think was the date through the next to last week of July. Those weeks alone, you get the extra $600 if you are filing, have filed. If you didn't file till April 15th, you're not going to get those first couple weeks. Um, and that's the part that the independent contractors can get this time around. Yeah. All right. Uh, that was fast and great. <laughs> we have some questions coming in. So Ben asks, since you work in several forms of performance, opera, dance, etc., how do you spin that variety to make yourself a more attractive candidate when interviewing for positions? Yeah, I like to say that I have a stage manager's toolkit of experience. And so I had uh, not only for the genres, but for different venues. So I can walk in and there's um, instead of being shocked by problems or whatever, it's like, okay, which challenge in my Rolodex, you know, that's a really old term for most people, my toolbox of, of things, um, you know, what can I pull on because I've had to be so adaptable, both in my own thinking of how to deal with something. And so it might be if we're doing a musical, it's like, do we have a conductor cam? The, the shot of the maestro is so much more prevalent in opera um, and a bit in ballet too, if there's a live orchestra. Um, and so trying to convince musical theater people that maybe that's what we could have. Um, so I, I love that, and to market myself of like, I don't have a set way of thinking. I can adapt to what your company does. I can bring in a couple things maybe that might help you if, if I think that you're open to those ideas and I don't wanna like step over and go, this is my way. Cause I'm totally, at least I try not to be that kind of a person. Um, but I think that my flexibility, and I also am hoping that when all of this settles out, um, that my flexibility like that is going to help me get back into it sooner than other people, let alone the experience I have with Zoom and breakout rooms and all that kind of stuff. I definitely started putting ability to manage up to 100 people in a breakout room for Zoom on my resume right now, because who knows what, if that's how we're going to rehearse. Yeah, when it's going to come in handy. Susie wants a full conversation just on AGMA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sarah asks, how did you become equity? And then what is ah. your favorite part of being a stage manager? A stage manager, um, yeah. not just equity. Um, so I did the EMC candidate thing for a while. I didn't write when I was younger because I knew I didn't want to turn too early. And my college, um, I had some great practical experience, but I only had one class basically in stage management. So I knew that I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I still, my favorite is to say, go intern and assist and all sorts of stuff. Um, Cause you can talk it all you want, but until you've done it, you haven't stage managed. Um, so I waited to try to earn some of my points. This was also back before the new rules that happened like two and a half years ago. So you had to get 50 points. And then at the time I was doing the, the system where if you were worked on certain shows at one theater, you could get points, but you couldn't on others. I kept getting all the black box shows because they trusted me to run the backstage by myself instead of having somebody else with me that was an equity ASM, but I couldn't get any points on those shows. So I ended up getting a ton of experience. And then when I wanted to turn equity and everybody finally thought I was pretty much ready, I was six points shy of my 50. And, um, and so that, at that point though, it, it, 
I still, so many of our jobs are about networking and who thinks you can do something and, and do they know you? I mean, Chelsea, you, you, it wasn't the only reason, but you got the interview because I knew you from SMMP. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it got you a foot in the door, didn't get you the job. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, so I, I was trying and trying, but by that point, several people thought I was ready to turn equity, but their own theaters were full and they didn't have a space for me. So when a little SPT was really in need of a stage manager, the stage manager above me said, she's ready, give her her card. So I got the poof your equity, as I call it, card. Um, I will say these days, if you're not EMC yet, think about it before you join because now you only need 25 points to get that, that card, or there's still always the poof your equity version. And it is kind of easy. It's not so much, but it, it's not totally easy, but it doesn't take you very long really to rack up 25 points. Once you get 50 points, a lot of people don't know this, you cannot work at the same equity theater or any equity theater unless they give you an equity contract then. So you can't do any more EMC gigs. You cannot be a non-union assistant anymore once you get 50 points. So think about when you want to join and, and think which way. And, and I still think that it is not about your first job. It's can you get the second union job? Because uh, somebody might offer you the first one. Um, but can you sustain? And right now, I was, I was actually unemployed before we hit the pandemic. I've been unemployed since February. I was holding off because I thought I was going to be very involved with the USIDD conference, which I have been, but online. Um, so I hadn't taken any gigs um, during March. I was supposed to have closed uh, today's Tuesday. So Sunday, I was supposed to have closed an opera. So I should have had another gig that got canceled since then. But I've been on unemployment since February. So the minute you turn equity, you and I are applying for the same gigs. And I'm not saying you're not going to get it over me. Uh, there are so many reasons that people get picked, but just you are suddenly in a very big pond. Uh, so, so take your time turning equity or not. And it depends on your market too. So absolutely. And then what's your favorite part of being a stage manager? Oh yeah. <laughs> I love pulling all the puzzle pieces together and, and thinking out for those people that aren't in the room and how can we, you know, I am not one person's yes man. I try to be the whole production's yes man. Yes woman. Um, and so I love seeing it come together and the, the brilliant ideas that somebody comes up with that you just never imagined could be. But then if you can also see a, a little moment, like I was doing a show where uh, it was the one scene where somebody was pregnant uh, in, the, in the scene and, you know, it goes on and then she has the baby later. Um, and I looked at it with the director and I was like, do we know that in this scene, the pregnant wife is never near her husband? <laughs> and if that director will let you kind of slide in and do a little bit, you know, it, the, the director stage management relationship can be the best thing out there. And some directors just don't quite get how to use a stage manager well. But those that do, and you can help be a little part of that. Um, and even we tried reblocking it, and the first time it fell apart. So he totally blamed me, and I totally took it. But ultimately, <laughs> it made the scene better. Um, you know, so if I can help with that kind of stuff. Um, or uh, when I was in ASM once, we were doing Grease. And um, the only thing that needed to happen at the end of the shift was that the sign needed to go away that said that they were looking for help, that ultimately Frenchly takes the job. What happens at the end of that scene is Roger gets depantsed. And I leaned over, I'm, I'm, this is a year out of college. I leaned over to my stage manager. I'm like, wouldn't it be awesome if he just grabbed that sign to cover himself off as he went off stage? And she's like, that sounds like a great idea. And it fit everything, you know? And so she passed it up the chain and that's ultimately what we did. It made the scene shift work. It made the acting work, all sorts of stuff. And I don't say, you don't want, I graduated with a directing stage management degree. You don't want me to direct a show. You want me to write down and take things, but there's those little pieces and I will maintain a show. And so I have, you know, tricks for myself. I write, try to write down every word the director says about directing. I have a whole section in my back page for that to try to help maintain the show. Cause I usually don't have an assistant director. I'm usually a one man band or me and some of the assistants, um, depending on the contract kind of stuff. Um, again, only on the musicals and the plays, not on all the other stuff. Um, but, uh, you don't want me to direct, but I can, I can look out for the, the integrity of a show, whether it's somebody got out of their light or that cue isn't quite landing right. Can we change the, the cueing of it? But I like bringing it all together. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Alexander said, what led you to stage management and how did you kind of get involved with all of the different? Yeah. So my parents' first date was supposed to be at the theater. Uh, my dad didn't realize that the show had closed the weekend before. 
the night I was born, a funny thing happened on the way to, a uh, funny thing happened on the way to the farm, literally. Uh, so going to theater, it was very much in my parents' blood. They took me to shows. Um, so when I was six, I saw a community theater production of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. A schoolmate of mine was a bluebird. I said, I could do that. <laughs> so the next year, I was the Wicked Witch of the West when she shrank. <laughs> seven years old. <laughs> And even from that show, I learned uh, what not to do and what to be scared of and all sorts of stuff because we had dry ice. I learned as a seven-year-old not to touch the dry ice, to stay far away from it. Uh, we had an adult, a 13-year-old, me, and a puppet all dressed the same. And in that version of Wizard of Oz, she's thrown into a cauldron and she shrinks. They also did it with the Tin Man's Axe, Tin Woodman's Axe. Um, uh, and so we would all come out at different times and start trying to crawl away before we get thrown in by the lion, cowardly lion again. And um, one, and flash pots were supposed to go off for the first two, not for me, the seven-year-old or the puppet. And one night, as everybody else was singing, ding dong, the witch is dead, we were putting out a fire because the 13-year-old's wig caught on fire um, with the flash pot. So I learned about, you know, <laughs> theater emergencies. Um, and they had said we could scream when our part came up. And so we did the, you know, ah, whatever. So the next night, flash pot went off for the adult, did not go off for the 13-year-old. And even at seven, I was like, oh, well, that's safer, you know. <laughs> uh, I was seven, I got thrown in, and the flash pot went off. Somebody had missed their cue and decided to go ahead and do it. <laughs> I screamed. But I also, it, you know, it's one of those things like, don't ever do that if you're <laughs> the stage manager. Don't put the seven-year-old through that. Don't just throw off pyro whenever you can. <laughs> Um, so I grew up loving musical theater, loving the world. We had, um, I worked with several disabled um, people in a touring show that, that I didn't even know of the term back then. I just knew that they didn't look quite like me. Um, and and uh, we had to help accommodate for, for what they needed to do on stage. But from the time I was 13 until I graduated high school, I was part of a touring group. So we'd put together a show. You, you took acting classes during the school year. Um, I actually was an assistant director for part of that. And then we'd take a week during the summer and put it all together. And I was always the oldest one. And especially once I got my driver's license, I was in charge of unpacking the attic, getting it into the van, yeah. getting it into the venue. If somebody was missing, how are we going to cover? Who's going to take all the extra lines? Uh, and I always had like one solo. Um, I could really pick up well a second soprano line that nobody else can read and follow in them because I can read music. Um, I badly learned how to tap dance. It was the only B I got in college. Um, <laughs> there was an A's. I took tap. It was very difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult, especially when you're taught the community theater version of tapping and then you go and try to take real tap classes. Yeah. Um, so uh, I thought theater was my thing. I only knew about acting. We didn't call them a stage manager, anything like that. If they were as a stage manager, they were on book. So I went in and was accepted to, to colleges um, as a BFA acting major. And as soon as I got there, I found out about this world of stage management, realized that the college I had picked was because I loved their tech so much. And I went, aha, this oh. is where I fit. And, and so then I switched immediately um, once I could. And, and, uh, and then it was a small enough department at the time. So I... Even, even switching late and all sorts of stuff, I had stage managed um, three large musicals by the time I graduated, as awesome. well as assisted and, and run crewed and all sorts of stuff. So I got a really good technical background. And my college was, I believe, one of the first to have moving lights. We were very connected to Vincent Lighting in Dayton, Ohio area. Um, so I called moving lights as a junior. Um, and that was very brand new back then. So the technical aspects certainly helped me. Um, and then I did the Lort Theater internship route. Um, and then my pathway to try to get into, but I didn't actually try any other genres because I wanted to do musicals. That was totally what I wanted to do. Luckily for me, I wanted to do musicals instead of just plays. So I already got, um, I kind, there, there are nuances to everything, but I feel if you can do a musical, you can do a play. If you can do a play, it's a different beast to do a musical. You can do both, um, but it's a lot easier to go from musicals to plays, I think, um, and take away the orchestra, take away, you know, calling on the downbeat and listening for more of the nuances uh, that is for calling a play. So at least I had the, and I had worked a dance concert at my school. So at least I had that little bit of background. Um, but my pathway to try weird things um, 
when I was at Long Wharf, one of the assistant stage managers had lost her stage manager. And she said, would you like to come join me with the Rockettes? And I was like, never done that before, but sure, let me try. Awesome. Um, I, I got my job at Long Wharf. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I got my job at Long Wharf, literally. So I was offered two different j- internships the di- uh, when I graduated college on the same day. And they both gave me time to think about it. I grew up in Ohio. One was in Indiana and one was in Massachusetts. And I knew me and I was going to go try to go home every day off to my boyfriend that was still in Ohio. So I took the leap and I went to Massachusetts. I am no longer with that boyfriend. Um, but the stage manager of that Massachusetts one went to Long Wharf. He took me to Long Wharf then when he had an opening. While I was at Long Wharf, I met Allison of the Rockettes. She took me to the Rockettes. My fourth year of Rockettes, we came through Denver. I met this lovely gentleman on the local crew and he's now my husband. So that's why I'm in Denver. So I moved here, various reasons, but ultimately moved here to be with him, caught in contact with some of my other electrician friends from being, doing the Rockettes here for three months or however long we had it open. And they said, gee, we need an assistant lighting designer at the Colorado Ballet. And I said, I don't do lights. I'm a stage manager. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 we need your organization. It's the assistant lighting designer. So we need you to keep track of the, loads, the lights that still need to be focused and especially what we tell the spot ups to do. I was like, okay, great, I can do that part. And it might lead to stage management. Two weeks later, by the time I moved here, they were training a dancer how to become a stage manager working on a show in rep, and he was a bit overwhelmed. So I ended up calling the, being the ALD and also calling the choreographer's showcase. And then um, while, uh, because their stage manager was becoming the general manager at the time. He was also working part-time for the opera company at uh, doing a co-production literally next door. And he said, I'm overwhelmed. Can I have you, can I pay you hourly to cover me? And I said, I've never done an opera, but okay. So I, in hindsight, I didn't know to be scared of the maestro like everybody else was. Um, so they liked my, my attitude <laughs> that I wasn't frightened by this maestro. Um, and, and also the IATSE crew that was in that building who it was like, you didn't request that music stand. And I would just bat my eyes and be like, but I didn't know we needed this and I'm the sub. So I see a music stand right here. Can I just grab that? <laughs> and so because of the way I handled it, they all went, well, we like you. So they ended up creating a job for me at the opera company, even though I'd never done opera before. And I learned, and I tried for a while to handle it in musical theater style and to call it a libretto. And in hindsight, I just laugh at myself and I'm like, yeah, this is why it didn't work. <laughs> there were a few things that worked, um, but I spent nine and a half years with that company. And by the end of it and through the recession, both for my sake and their sake, 60% of my paycheck became from marketing and I ran their social media and their website which is why I'm online all the time, because that was my job for about seven years. Um, So I can't get away from it. I still keep trying to pull away, but I was literally following trends and trying to figure out Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. Um, But so I was there for nine and a half years, but I was still sort of a make do lighting person as we'd go to a big, big school in Wyoming. I'd try to figure out their lighting board because oil companies give lighting boards to, to high schools and they have lots of money. But meanwhile, then I go to a church and I'd run the Rio stats in the back of the, the church and I mostly cut, t- hauled tubs of props around. And so I, I was, I had steady, I had benefits, I had my health insurance. I could have most of my weekends off unless we had a show. I became a river guide cause that's what you do in Colorado. Um, but it took my father dying for me to go, what am I doing? This is still not true stage managing. Mm-hmm. I work with lovely people, all that kind of stuff, but my heart just isn't quite here. I don't like running a website. Um, I can do my own personal website, you know, but I don't love running websites. And actually I avoided my own website for many years. <laughs> I finally wrote, did one about two and a half years ago. Um, so I kept, I bit every year at USITT, especially, I was like, okay, all right, if anybody's looking. And I finally, that year, right as my dad was dying, I was like, okay, I have to market myself. What can I do? What can I do? You know, got advice from all the people at USIDT. And I finally got a company in Milwaukee to the Skylight Opera Theater to give me two contracts in their season. And that was enough for me to go, okay. Remember what I said earlier? It's not about the first job, it's the second. They gave me two. (laughs) So it was like, and then in hindsight, that was the year that they had the big negotiations on Broadway and they changed our health weeks. And so we used to have to earn 20, which doesn't sound like very much out of 52, but it's really hard. And because of the negotiations of the production contract, they reduced it to 19, 
they had offered me 19 weeks or 18 weeks of health insurance. So I only had to make one more week. That's amazing. And so since then, until the pandemic, <laughs> I have earned my health insurance yeah. for, for four and a half years now. So there's your long answer <laughs> how I got into everything. Kind of piggybacking off of that, uh, Colin asked to be a career stage manager with your primary sole income from SMA. Do you think you need to join equity? It depends what your, um, I mean, certainly if you're a dance stage manager, because there are other things besides theater, no. <laughs> you may join AGMA. Even so, um, probably most of the dance stage managers, because I know there are some, like I see Susie. Hi, Susie. Um, uh, and she's the one who said we should have a whole contact, con uh, discussion about AGMA. Um, know your market and know what you want to do, because Denver is actually kind of hard to work equity in. It's why I work out of state most of the time. Um, uh, there are two big companies. I've interviewed with them three times, um, but uh, various reasons, and we're, I'm going to be politically safe and not go into those. <laughs> but otherwise, it's SPTs and guest artists and stuff that aren't, to me, livable wages. And there's a lot of non-union theater here. So if you want to get experience, there's a lot here. It's a beautiful place to live. Um, but working here is kind of hard. Chicago, it depends on, on what you want to do, but Chicago has a really big non-equity scene. So if you want to do Chicago, I would recommend starting with the non-union stuff for a while until you get your credits up. Uh, I'm not a Chicago person, so that may not be the right way to do it, but that's my impression. Um, and, and see where you want to go. Is it an equity town or is it not if theater is your thing? If theater is not your thing and it's dance or opera or Cirque, then you probably don't necessarily want to join a union until you're offered the contract. Alexandra asks, what are the benefits of being both equity and AGMA? Uh, some extra letters on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's really, I actually did not turn AGMA until 2018. Uh, because it's a sister union, I had debated joining for many years without a contract. And I didn't know, I couldn't really get an answer from people of whether that was a sort of, oh, She's AGMA, but she's never worked it. I couldn't tell if that was a thing, but it was mainly to get the equity people off my back that didn't understand how AGMA works and that there aren't that many union contracts because I wanted to work opera and ballet and there aren't very many union contracts. So AGMA says, we let our people work non-union. And so I was going, well, AGMA says it's okay to me, you know, to be non-union in that jurisdiction, even though I was equity. So I mainly... I had debated joining AGMA for years. Then I was offered a gig that was AGMA. I'm like, I'm ready to take my card in that. I don't care. Um, and I had get a, a half reduced fee to join. Um, so uh, I personally, and this is part of why I think Susie said this, AGMA is not a very strong union. Um, there will be people that argue that. Um, it's particularly not very strong for stage managers. Like I said, of those 67, there's at least 10. And I want to go through every contract because I can see them all. Um, I want to go through every contract, but there's at least 10 of them that don't even put their stage managers on contract. So uh, joining AGMA is not necessarily the right idea for a stage manager. Um, that said, you, you know, you get your, your overtime, you get all the benefits. And so equity jobs definitely have their benefits. I know how many hours on paper I'm supposed to work, that whole how many hours do you work before or after rehearsal is kind of up for debate in a lot of companies, what counts as hours or not in production meetings and stuff. But I have more of an ability to say, that's such a large span of day. Uh, do you want to pay me overtime? I can fight for it more on an equity contract for sure. Um, and I certainly... Uh, equity is the only way right now that I can earn health insurance um, and may not earn health insurance this year. Um, so equity, I'd certainly join over AGMA at this point, um, but it is totally a personal decision. Absolutely. Christina asks, what types of dance have you stage managed and what have, are the quirks of stage managing different styles, modern ballet, if you have? Yeah, I'm, I'm a, 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 a step my foot in dance. Um, uh, I did work for the Rockettes for five years. And that, like we said, is a totally different dance style than anybody else. The precision, both for them and for us, it, um, you know, you have, you know, lighting things up exactly the right way. Even my dance numbers. So if you have a zero, two, four, six out across the stage every two feet, even the numbers had to be the right size sticker and you couldn't put them like this. 
So then the girls would start. And so even, even I would take lasers in. I mean, literally when I met my husband, this may not be the quite true story, but it's how I'm telling it. Um, <laughs> I came into the town. I'm the brand new person. And it's like, I'm going to be the most anal person you've ever met as we try to make a set because we didn't travel with our own floor. So I had to put down all of these spike marks on my own with a crew I'd never met before. And, and um, you know, I saw somebody in the chat mentioned they hadn't even thought about how precise, the, how precise the spikes are. But it's not just about putting the spike, but it's like, which side of the tape? Because a tape is at least a half an inch wide and the tape measure can be up to an inch wide. So which side of the tape are we using? And I, I'm sure Chelsea's having flashbacks and trying yeah. to grab the tape out of set with me. <laughs> It's why right now, if I'm doing stuff, I prefer the two tape triangulation method that I've said for years, I'm going to write a blog post on. It's going to come this summer, some point this summer, maybe in the next month, you're going to get a blog post on how to do two tape tri triangulation, but is the most exact that you can do, especially by yourself. And I finally have figured out a way to, to anchor the points and all sorts of stuff. So at some point I'll be sharing that. Um, but so, so Rockets is a whole different beast. Um, you do have the injuries and the foam rollers and, and the ice baths and having a physical therapist around that you don't get with a lot of musical theater and plays and stuff like that, that you tend to get in a lot of ballet companies, um, that kind of stuff. I actually, at Actors Theater of Louisville last fall when I worked there, they actually had a physical therapist come in a couple of days for us. And it was so nice. So, and anybody could go, stage managers, crew, Anybody can go. It didn't have to be just performers. Um, so I hope that more companies start doing that. Um, but it's much more typical in a dance company. And like when I was in uh, Vegas, I was allowed to go, you know, partake of that, especially if I was, you know, bent over my computer or whatever, they were willing to help me work on my back, that kind of stuff. Um, then when I was with the opera company, we did several collaborations with what had been Ballet Nouveau Colorado, and now they're called Wonderbound, my favorite modern dance group that's out there. Um, so, so original. Um, and so we did a combination, opera, Colorado Symphony, I, I was with, working with Central City Opera, um, Colorado Symphony, at the time they were called Ballet Nouveau Colorado, a Jewish cultural center and a performance venue. We all did a big collaborative night. And so I got to call off of their dance, uh, modern dance piece for that. And that was so much fun. Um, and then uh, I just spent two years on this gigantic Vegas uh, nutcracker, which I will say was a beautiful, for, for as many bells and whistles as they had, it really was one of my favorite productions artistically. I mean, they told the story well with a four story tall uh, dollhouse and flying by foy and pyro and a uh, giant bird cage. Because why not have the Arabian dance with a giant peacock who gets loaded in intermission up in the flies um, and video and all sorts of stuff. So uh, and then uh, certainly a fair amount of tap in a lot of the musicals I've done. Uh, learned tap myself. Like I said, it was the only B, B I got in college. Um, uh, not that I'm bitter about it. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of the, um, and then working in them, uh, they're variations on a theme. So you might, as a stage manager for Nutcracker, I call off the music, but for the choreographer showcase that I did for the ballet, um, I called off, I had a series of, uh, it was an Excel document, but a series of visual cues and, and um, uh, I couldn't see the tracked music. It was all off the track music, but I had start timer. And so every track I'd try to start a timer. And so I'd have a note that like two minutes and nine seconds in on these words. So I still kind of made a little bit of a script in there or on this visual, um, some people call off of, of patterns. And so we'll have just like lots of little blocking diagrams. Um, so ballet is kind of, or ballet and dance and all of that. Um, if it's not a structured show, like Nutcracker is all the music. Um, all the way through, though we moved all the pieces around and did it in a different order than anybody else. Um, but ballet and dance, that's kind of the interesting is like, what do you call it off of? For Rockettes, we call it off of dancer counts. So instead of following the music, you were still call, and I use it this day for all of my musicals, until I need to call off the music, I would much prefer to call off a libretto and not have to turn all those pages. But I can add in a dancer count of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or, or even today, two, three, four, five. Um, and so Rockettes definitely taught me all of that, but Dance of the March of the Wooden Soldiers has no lyrics whatsoever. So it was literally all these counts of eight and occasionally only a count of seven because it's how they counted it. Um, and, uh, and that was again, early 2000s, new to moving lights. Every girl had a moving light on her. And so we called all of, you know, every time they moved, but they're so precise 
you could put the moving lights exactly to them. And so if you called it on the and beat for this one and the downbeat for this one, the music would line up or the lights would line up with the music. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So I think this is the last question. There's a lot of um, loving your tape method, taping method. I want to, well, you send me the chat later so yeah, I can see because I haven't been staring at it at all. Yeah. Um, Colette asks, what experience with any SM tech programs do you have and do you recommend any? She's been looking at stage right because she does Dave, a lot of racing. So maybe a racer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my favorite non-tech, but I love, because I, I've been doing enough webinars, they're so within reach. Um, these little flags from Dezo are see-through, and you can put them right over a music note. Chrissy Higgins from Opera Australia taught me about this, and she said, I don't understand why Americans don't use this, and I said, because we don't know about them. So, <laughs> so if you go into lots of uh, Facebook groups, you will see me advertising these all the time. Um, I have to buy them online. They're from Japan. There are some Dezo stores in some people's very lucky vicinities, so go look for them. Um, and they've changed their packaging. But these are see-through little lines, and I can put them exactly over which beat of music to call. Um, so that's my newer technology that's not really technology. Um, I watched the Stage, White, Stage Right webinar the other day, too. They have totally changed since the first time I saw it. Um, because I, I'm starting to maybe be convinced um, until you get something that is, uh, you know, both pages, and, and there was, uh, there's so many that have been on the Broadway Stage Management Symposium ones, um, too, so all of the names are somewhat similar, like there's like Q2Q and Call Q and all of the ones, so I have to go back through them all and look, but until you can get me to see both sides of the page, because I'm a one script person. Uh, unless it's a long running show, I need to see the blocking at the same time I see my cues because if my lighting cue is not working out, it's probably because my college age actor is not moving the right place. Uh, so I need to see all of that at the same time. And I'm very much, uh, I don't trust technology to not fail on me because I tend to have gremlin shows. So I'm still very much a paper person. That said, I am all about fixing the script during prep and then continuing during tech or whatever so that it works for me so I can print it off and use it. So I'm a big fan of a, a fan of a Frankenscript or a Scorpt. Um, so you've got the libretto, you've got the music, all sorts of, you've got the dancer counts, whatever you need. Um, I, when I was working at New Harmony with you, actually the summer I worked with you, I was so excited to realize I had a .edu email account and I could buy things at the educator discount. So I bought Adobe Acrobat Pro and that's like the best thing for stage managers if you can afford it. And especially if you have an educator discount um, because you can take the crappy PDFs that they give you with the black line that nobody was paying attention to when they ran it through the script or they turned it slightly. Um, and so there's various buttons you can do to fix all of that. You can say, I want this much margin so I can put my cues on the left and I can put my timings on the right side of the page for every quick change. Um, and then you can say shrink to fit and it just goes and does it. Um, and sometimes it'll even do a text recognition. So like Chelsea and I, uh, she learned my coding for line notes. So I took the loan line notes and then would hand her a page and she would type the line notes and we got most of them done before they left for the day. Um, so that kind of stuff for technology, I totally love, uh, but um, I'm still a paper pro. I'm the same way. Um, taping, taping. <laughs> okay, I know I need to write that blog post. I've taken pictures and everything. I just need to do it. I had it all ready to go like a year ago and then realized nobody could buy the tape measures I had. So I had to spend another couple months researching what tape measures were out there that we could all use. So now I know. How do you spell the brand name for the post-its that you were talking about? Oh, my little flags? Daiso. D-A-I-S-O from Japan. And usually this, this version, the extra special words you need to know are fluorescent color index tabs and 600 of them. But I think they've changed their packaging. So I haven't used the new brand. These are still the ones I find on either eBay or Amazon, depending on the day. People love these post-its. Um, have you ever pre-cut your spikes? I don't too much, but speaking of spikes, guess what I have near me? This is my favorite. Uh, I'm, there, get in front of me. There we go. Spike stick. Um, so I have, I, I just refill it, whatever uh, place I go to. Um, but I tend to take, because a lot of companies only have about five colors. And so I get a, a few more options with all of mine. And then uh, it's just a dowel with a string on it. 
I have been trying to do research and I would love for somebody to tell me uh, what their experience is. Um, you can find me at AaronJoyceWank.com or Chelsea or whatever. Um, but I wonder who was the first person to create the spike stick. I've been using one since 2001 when I joined the Rockettes and that was the first time I had seen it and I wasn't the first year of it. But I do wonder if the Rockettes stage managers were the first ones to do it because even one of them used to sell them on, on, uh, online. Cassie Apthorpe used to make them. Um, but we used to take the girl, the girls all had, sorry, I don't mean to be diminutive with the, the girls, the rocks, um, all had, uh, drumsticks and they, they would wrap them around their wrists so that they wouldn't fall off. And then they would, uh, you know, imagine a drumstick on the end of this and they would play jingle bells on each other's backs on these little xylophone packs, uh, glockenspiel packs. Um, and whenever one of their drumsticks would get too far broken to use, stage management would take them and we'd turn them into a spike stick. And I don't know if we were the first ones to, I wasn't the first one to do it. I, I went into the Rockettes and they'd already done it. But I do wonder if the Rockettes were the first ones to do it. And uh, I see somebody, somebody saying, oh, Ailey had them in the mid nineties. Okay. All right. Um, but okay. See, this is, I finally have some dance stage managers around. I think dance people were the first ones to do it. Everybody that's answering is dance people, Ailey and Susie Kailborn. So yeah. Um, I'm intrigued to know. Uh, so yeah, find me and tell me your stories about spike sticks. Um, so I don't pre-cut them, but I have them very handy to me so that I don't have to carry around. And then I am a big fan of putting glow tape, uh, cutting out different, whether you hole punch or whether you make little squares or, or rectangles on a sheet protector. I'm walking around with that. So again, I'm not walking around with the long thing, not have to peel the stupid glow tape off the back of the other thing. Um, hole punching is great until you have to then peel it off of the back of it. If you, some people walk around with a little Altoid tin, you still have to peel them all. So just go ahead and peel it first before you make all your shapes, stick it onto a sheet protector. Yeah. Someone said it's someone with no fingernails, yes. Yes, me too. I have terrible fingernails. <laughs> That's probably why. <laughs> great. So um, I know we're running a little over, but does anyone have any final questions? I don't, Colin says, do they make bigger size hole punches? Mm, maybe craft stores, you know, the Martha, Martha Stewart punches. I don't know what those would do. Interesting. All righty, everyone. Do you have any final thoughts to wrap it up? No, I think it's fun that you're doing all these. Absolutely. So. And yeah. can you remind everyone um, where they can find you on the internet if they want to. Absolutely. Connect. I do have my own website, erinjoyswank.com, uh, spelled just my full name out, uh, slash blog if you really want to follow the blog. And then there's a little cloud tag that can, can, you can click on for the opera ones or that kind of stuff. Uh, you can definitely find me with the Stage Managers Association. I, I tend to be very visible there um, on all the Facebook groups. You'll probably see me posting. Uh, I just posted today. Uh, tomorrow I'm interviewing. And here's a plug for you, combination. Antonia Collins is next week's Q&A uh, person, but tomorrow she and I are talking, she's a good friend of mine, uh, about British stage management. Um, along with somebody from the SMA of the UK. Um, so that is tomorrow uh, at two o'clock Eastern because it's already seven o'clock their time. Yep. Over, uh, <laughs> so for me, it's noon. Um, Cause I'm I in talk noon. next week with hers earlier too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so look for all of those webinars. Occasionally you can find me with USITT. We're actually taking a break from the portfolio reviews um, and, and interview materials prep and the resume doctors that my friend Deb runs. Um, but they may come back in a month or so. We'll see. Um, and you can find me in the Stage Managers Association group, the Dance Stage Management, the new Facebook group, the Year of the Stage Manager, all of those. You can find me. Uh, I do ask that you don't friend me if we haven't actually had a conversation. I know my face is out there a lot um, and I hate to turn down people, but if I don't know who you are, I'm not going to friend you. So just don't ask. But you can instant message me. I will talk to you, all sorts of stuff. Um, put a comment in some public group so I know to look for it. Um, and there's a contact us form on the, uh, on my website too. So great. It froze for a minute. So I was, I just, I was yeah, like, oh. you stayed on the whole time. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining. I hope you join us next week with Antonia. And if you want, uh, the playback, just shoot me an email at tipsy theater traveler at gmail.com and I can get you the playback. And if you have any further questions, you can email me there. And theater uh, is spelled R-E, right? Yes, theater is R-E. Mm -hmm. Which is, to me, the right way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest it's of your very evening. Bye. Bye.